This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. Welcome to the How to Run for Office Podcast for My Campaign Coach. This week, we're talking to James Spadola, host of the Elected Officials of America podcast, about the fantastic campaign advice he's learned from interviewing dozens of underdog elected officials and during his own campaign for the Delaware State Senate. Before we get to that, if you're enjoying the podcast, I'd encourage you to check out some of the other content we're putting out regularly. On Facebook, you can find our campaign mastermind group by searching for the Elite Campaign Mastermind, and our page is under My Campaign Coach. If you want to help support our efforts, you can do that with financial support via patreon.com slash mycampaigncoach. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash mycampaigncoach. Or we're going over to iTunes and give us a nice five-star rating. James Spadola is a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom and former police officer. He's been politically involved for quite a while, and he ran for the state senate last election cycle. While he ultimately lost the election in a heavily Democratic district, James learned an incredible amount about what it takes to become an elected official and became even more passionate about helping equip candidates to run for office. Last September in 2017, James started interviewing elected officials from across the country, traveling across the nation to talk to both Republicans and Democrats about why they ran and how they won. In addition to listening to this interview with James, I hope you'll check out his podcast, especially the Chicken Soup for the Candidate Soul recap episode, where he talks a lot about some of the top advice he's received from candidates across the country. With that, let's get to the interview. James, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, man. I appreciate you having me on. Well, you know, it's been really cool getting to connect with you through you finding my podcast and me finding out more about yours, these fellow podcast conservatives looking at elected officials and how to win election. It's it's something that we have a, a kind of a confluence of interest and we're both working in. So it's great to make a connection with you. I'm excited about what you're doing and, and you're you're traveling a lot around the country meeting with actually getting in person whereas I'm talking a lot of folks over the airwaves, you're meeting with people in person and talking online and off about how they're winning elections, right? Yeah, so I started it in September, and I was doing it full-time uh, at that point. So since then, I've interviewed, uh, or online, I've got, I want to say, 25 episodes at this point, uh, but I've been to 18 states in, over the couple months that I've been doing it. <laughs> right interviewed on. Republicans, Democrats, uh, so totally nonpartisan. And really, I, I would tell you, I have two main goals with it. One, I want to inspire people to run for office. And underneath the umbrella of that goal, there's one, there's breaking down the, uh, the barriers that people put in their minds about being a politician or running for office. And two, it's highlighting the enormous challenges and the enormous odds that people had to overcome to win. And, uh, you know, because it's remarkable some of the stories that are out there. And my, the other main goal of it is to hear what we can do as a country to, to come together again and unify. You know, I've taken a two oaths to uphold the Constitution when I joined the Army. And I was a police officer for eight and a half years. And I think like a lot of people, I don't like uh, the bitter and hatred in the air. So um, just trying to hear what some of our elected officials from across the country have to say on on all of those fronts has been a uh, very uh, uh, very inspiring to me and hopefully to some of my listeners as well. Well, I mean that's something that I've found from talking with a lot of my listeners online and off and through the guests that I've had over the last year plus. And and I want to I'm gonna just throw out up front that if folks are interested in hearing more from you because they they should be that the place they go to find is electedofficialsofamerica.com. James Spadola, they can they can Google that. But electedofficialsofamerica.com is where they can find you online. They can find you on iTunes, and they can find you on any, yeah. whatever their podcast catcher of, of preference is. They can find you there. And and we'll be linking, of course, through the My Campaign Coach website over in this the, the blog that accompanies this episode. We'll be making sure that we link over because I'm, I'm a big believer in what you're doing. I'm intrigued to learn more about what you're doing as far as traveling the country, 18 states. I <laughs> think that's huge. And I, I think there's a lot to learn. You recently released a recap episode because you've got a bunch of episodes out talking with individuals that have run from city council and school board on up the line. But you recently released the Chicken Soup for the Candidate's Soul episode recap. 
And I'd love for us to start out, let's let's get to the episode itself and kind of some of your big takeaways eventually, but I'll first want to find out more about, you know, let our listeners know more about you and your story, because you've been in the Army, you've been a police officer, now you're talking to candidates. How the heck did you get to this point? <laughs> yes, yeah, you know, I've always tried, I've always been a big fan of taking the, uh, the path least traveled um, and doing things that, you know, a lot of people in my family haven't done, join the Army. Uh, become a police officer. My uncle was a cop, but in my immediate family, I mean. Um, but so I ran for state Senate in 2016 in Delaware as a moderate Republican in a very, very blue district. Blue, in a, you know, I, I, I live in a very blue district in a very blue state. I registered three to one, uh, but still got 44 percent of the votes. So it was a great experience, made so many great connections. And, and that's one of the things that I tried to pass off in the podcast. It's, you know, one of the things that somebody told me when I was first thinking about running for office is you're probably not going to win just straight up. But as long as you lose well and <laughs> you, you end confidence. up in a place. <laughs> yeah. As long as you, you lose well and you end up in a better place than when you started, then it's not really a loss. Right. And, um, you know, I'm, I made so, you know, I, the networking, there's there's really no better networking, but uh, unintentional networking than running for office, because that's really what you're doing day in and day out with your neighbors, with business leaders, with civic leaders. And from that networking, uh, I got a good opportunity at a nonprofit. I was looking to leave law enforcement for uh, a host of reasons. Um, so I got a good opportunity at a nonprofit, jumped, jumped, jumped on it, had a good experience there, still wanted to do something a little more creative. Um, so launched this and I just started helping another nonprofit expand into Delaware. So I'm back into the, uh, uh, the meeting and the networking game in, in a different regard, um, setting up uh, coding programs in middle schools and high schools. So out there hustling on that front and uh, with the elected officials front. And the, the chicken soup episode that you mentioned, Raz, I think, uh, you know, I, I do. I, that's probably the episode I think that we've put out so far. Because it's, it's 25 minutes. Uh, it speaks with uh, I speak with legislators from Alaska to Maine and a bunch from Delaware just because, you know, I'm a big fan of Delaware, obviously. But all of them, you know, they go through uh, some of the hardest times of their campaign. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Matt Meyer, the county executive for Newcastle County, where he was told uh, he, he beat a three term incumbent in 2016 in a Democratic primary. He was told if he didn't raise a half a million dollars, he didn't stand a chance. And uh, when I heard that, he was four months away from his election, from the election, and he'd only raised twenty thousand dollars. You know, <laughs> so uh, and he's campaigning full time. Um, you know, but you know, what does he do? He just goes out there and works, and he he pulls it off. Um, and I, I could go on and on about the the upsets, specifically in that episode. But there's just so many stories like that that even if you're not into politics it's i think it's uh, pretty inspiring and if you're even thinking about running for office in the least um, or you are running for office and you've got people from your own party trying to talk you out or uh, you've got civic leaders saying it's not your time because you know they like the good old boy or you're not you're, you're not missing you're not making any fundraising target not that anyone ever actually hits those um but you know you're not alone there's just so many people out there that are going through the same struggles but they still cross the finish line and have won and even if you don't win uh, like me you'll end up in a better place than you were well and the cool thing is i mean you've got to meet some really impressive people i mean not all folks that you and i agree with ideologically but you got to meet people from folks that have won elected office at 20 years old to folks who've literally gone from you know, a housekeeper to representative to folks that have, you know, that are running against the curve on the ideological spectrum I mean, you know, representing their district from the other side of the aisle, so to speak, to folks from that have been NFL players to on the line. I mean, it, it's, it's a really cool <laughs> yeah. cross section. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the woman in Rhode Island, the housekeeper, I, I think that has got to be the most. The, there, there's not a better political rags to riches story. And it's something that makes you proud to be an American. Amen. Um, you know, she was born Mar Marsha Wrangland Vassal, Democrat in Rhode Island. If you're listening, hello. But uh, <laughs> just to tell you her story real quickly. Yeah, do it. Uh, she was born in, ja born in Jamaica, one of nine kids. Her father couldn't read or write. She grew up without running water. Um, she moved to the States. She, be she was a housekeeper. She eventually became a teacher. And then out of nowhere, she was motivated by all the homicides in Rhode Island. She runs a three and a half month campaign 
against the House Majority Leader. So, you know, not some wow. small pickings legislator, but not the House Majority Leader. Uh, and she beat him. Um, she was a, a single issue candidate. And I, I say that I, I don't say that condescending. I say that's what she ran on. She ran on gun violence. And, you know, she did uh, increase her platform after talking to the constituents. But she was hammered home the message of uh, doing what she could to end gun violence uh, in Rhode Island. And she, you know, pulled off a major upset, which uh, the Rhode Island press called it a political earthquake. And, I, you know, I think there's that to me, I, you know, when we were talking I probably didn't agree with 90 percent of what she was saying to me about, um, you know, her her beliefs and whatnot. But I you, I respect her passion. I know she's well intentioned and there's probably a good chance I would vote for her if she were my uh, my rep. Just because, like you were saying before, Raz, um, it, this is about getting good people to run, uh, not about the, the party. And especially, you know, I'm in a blue state. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, luckily a lot of the democratic voters do vote in Republicans from time to time. And you're in a very red state, but I'm sure (laughs) you would still agree the importance, (laughs) but I'm sure you would still uh, agree on the importance of having two, at least two viable political parties. You know, if the, if the Democrat, if the democratic party just went away, uh, and the Republican party had no competition whatsoever, um, you know, or, or in Delaware, if the, you know, if we just had the Democratic Party, I, I don't see that being a good outcome for the state, for the elected officials that got would get m- way more complacent than they already do. Um, so, you know, you were comp- complimenting me. I, I, I applaud you for uh, pounding the pavement and uh, doing what you do as well. I, I appreciate it, James. It's it's one of those things where, you know, much like yourself, I have a passion for seeing individuals that care about the future of our country and our states running for office because that's really – the the plank upon which our republic depends because if we don't have individuals who care about the future running and fighting hard uh you're from opposite ends of the spectrum really i mean like you said it's like it's important that we have a rigorous debate and you know in texas you know more of it's on you know republican or republican violence type thing where we have within the primary a lot of fights because the democrat party is less effective and has less of a shot at the general election so we have a lot more of it on the you know intra republican fight Absolutely. You know, it's it's funny uh, when you're talking about uh, a sense you were saying about candidates that are ideologically driven uh, or, you know, fighting for what they believe in. Uh, one of my first interviews was with Mike Castle, who is a, absolutely a, a Delaware legend in politics, former governor, former congressman. And one of the things he was saying about how can we come together as a country is he would want people that are not so ideologically driven, not so party driven. Um, but then I went up to Maine and I spoke with uh, their youngest state senator, Eric Brakey, who uh, at 26 beat a longtime Democratic incumbent there. Wow. And he's now running for U.S. He's running for U.S. Senate now against uh, independent Angus King. Uh, hardcore Rand Paul guy, hardcore Ron Paul. Helped, nice. He got involved with politics. Uh, in 2012. Uh, yeah, Rand Paul just had a fundraiser for him up in Maine. Uh, <laughs> I love it. About probably a month or two ago. But, you know, to me, it's it's funny. I see a lot of consistent themes with the people I'm speaking about. Uh, but then I see a lot of inconsistencies where I see Mike Castle telling me no, I, no ideological uh, driven candidates. And then I have er- Eric Brakey saying he won because he was ideologically driven. And, you know, even though he ran in a blue district at, as a libertarian, uh, you know, he, he still he still pulled it off. And, you know, when I was in Vermont, you hear from people. Um, I spoke with uh, Chris Pierce, state senator Chris Pearson, who worked for Bernie Sanders. Um, and, you know, there's people in Vermont that they're going to that didn't agree with Bernie, but they know where he stands and they yeah. respect that. And they rather vote for somebody where they know where they stand than somebody who just equivocates or, or dodges an issue. So. Um, you know, it's, it's a matter of, uh, putting your beliefs out there and, and letting the voters decide. What are some of the, the top things you've seen from the people you've talked to in all these episodes? What have made the difference for them? It all comes down to voter contact. Um, nothing, nothing can overcome or nothing can surpass a candidate meeting a voter and even if it's only for five to ten seconds, letting that person, that potential, that future voter, form an impression of you, 
in person, human being to human being, as opposed to seeing you on a commercial, um, you know, or just on a piece of literature. You know, I was thinking about uh, Mike Ramone, somebody who uh, I did an episode with him. He he lost not once, not twice, not three times, not four times. Or he lost. Yes, he lost four times and won on his fifth time. Could you imagine losing four elections <laughs> and still yeah. running on a fifth time? Oh, my gosh. Could, that's that's like going back for an yeah. extra special level of pain right there. Absolutely. But one of the things he said, and it's in that candidate chicken soup, um, if you know, if when somebody meets you, if they trust you, if they trust your insides is what he says, you're going to get their vote. And I think that comes back to what we were saying about putting your beliefs out there, because, you know, people can respect disagreeing with you um, because at least they trust that you're telling them the truth. Um, so I, I think that that is definitely the biggest theme, um, just just getting out there, pounding the pavement. Um, you know, I think of uh, in Alaska, David Wilson, he, he got out fundraised. I think it's four four to one off the top of my head. I think he raised fifteen thousand dollars for a state Senate race in Alaska, which, uh, you know, that's it's a you know, it's a rural area. So it's not exactly the most conducive to door knocking, but he beat he beat that by pounding the doors. And, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons he did it. You can, uh, you know, he wanted to show young people that you don't need one hundred thousand dollars <coughs> to win a race. And especially with somebody who's been in office for so long, uh, they're going to be they're going to come a little pl- complacent. And, yeah. you know, they're not going to be out there pounding the pavement uh, like uh, like some fresh youngster can. And, I, you know, from my own experience, the one thing that surprised me and speaking with all these young elected officials, um, I used to think that, you know, people were, you know, people wanted to vote for older people. Uh, people are impressed by a young person that is running for office. They yes. really are uh, because they're so used. They're, they're so used to seeing the, the old white male that if you if you show up as a politician at anything contrary to that, that is something they will remember. That is something that is unique to them. It stands out in a big way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think uh, uh, there's no better rebuttal to if somebody says you're too young than what Alex Torpy, who was elected mayor of uh, South Orange, New Jersey, in one of my episodes, uh, he was elected when he was 23 years old. And, you know, if somebody says you're too young, it's like, well, you know, we've got we've got soldiers overseas. We've got uh, we've got young people running, you know, billion dollar companies. Is a young person really too young to run a town? And, and in addition to that, are the the people that you've been voting for, the elderly people that you see in your mind that f- fitting the ideal image of a candidate, how have those results been for you? And, you know, you might not win them over that right then and there, but you'll probably get them to, to take a pause. Yeah, I think for so many of those folks, it's like, look, what do you believe in? Who's fighting for that? And and maybe it's the case that the age is not all that important. It's, it's more about the maturity of the individual it's what are they fighting for and and how well they align with what you believe in are they going to truly fight for that and if they are heck vote for them it doesn't matter whether they're a long shot because we've seen so many examples and you've interviewed plenty of them folks that traditional wisdom the conventional wisdom says they don't have a chance in hell but as it turns out, they actually have a pretty good chance because they're able to get out there. They're going to campaign in a unique way. They're going to fight an asymmetrical battle, something that you're familiar with from your army days, and and say, look, you know, you may have the money, you may have the air war, but I'm going to fight a ground war that you can't touch. And that happens to be the area that I'm, you know, of, of my greatest expertise of where I've spent most of my political years is on the ground war campaign side. And, and you know, we have we all have internal biases, right? And, and so I generally default to more of that side of things than air war. But I've also got a fair amount of, and, and you as well, a fair amount of of, uh, of actual research that suggests that working on the ground side gives you an asymmetrical advantage. And I'd specifically be interested mm-hmm. to find out, you know, both in your race as well as some of the ones you've covered and, and talked about on your on your podcast. You know, what are some of the really good ground war epi- you know, victories that you've seen? What have been the primary contributors to that? Uh, you know, I wouldn't say I get too in-depth into the ground strategy with, uh, 
with them. Um, you know, it's just a matter of, uh, of being present and whether you're at a grocery stores or, or pounding on doors. But one question I wanted to ask you, Raz, not to, not to pivot on you, but what is, I know you've, you've worked on campaigns, uh, across the country. What is the biggest voter registration disadvantage you've seen overcome? Man, that, that's a that's a really good question. I, I you know I'd, I'd have to go back and look. Most of my efforts have been focused on Texas, uh, where in most cases we okay. don't have you know th- th- you know most of the hardest races we see in Texas on the municipal level because in Texas we don't have a partisan bent to them at all. It's like you you run Republican or Democrat, you run. There's no letter next to your name on the ballot. It's all nonpartisan, you know, truly nonpartisan. And Republicans in Texas, while it's a deeply red state in a lot of ways. We see a lot of a lot of Democrat involvement in the municipal elections. That's very very effective, and they'll make you know state party endorsements and local party endorsements in these races. And Democrats take a lot of the the municipal seats, even in deeply red areas, areas that are never threatened on the on the state house or state senate level. Democrats will will run away with the the municipal level offices because. They actually work and fight on that level, and it's you know to their credit that you know they they do good work there, and and Republicans don't typically. And I'm not sure how much that's mm. consistent across the board in other states, but I know in Texas they've they've really leveraged a particular advantage there on the municipal level where we haven't. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, and you said those are nonpartisan. Yeah, it's it, these are you know typically they're they're different election cycles. You know we have you know, our March primary elections, we have November generals, we have May municipals, and so the school board and the, and the city council offices are all nonpartisan, so they don't have a single letter next to the name an R or a D or an I, and okay. and so you know, it really becomes down to a lot more personality, and so it gives a unique opportunity for folks that are running that are counter the party that's in power in a given area. Yeah, because. That's one thing where I would say that the jury is still out in terms of how much of a ground game can overcome just a drastic registration disadvantage in a partisan election. Uh, just at, on my from my own work, um, the biggest one that comes to mind is Anthony Del Colo, who uh, he was a co-candidate with me in Delaware last year, and he was out registered two to one uh, Democrat to Republican. So it was. Fifty percent Democrat registration, twenty five percent Republican, twenty five percent independent. That's uh, crazy. He he won with fifty one percent of the vote, um, <laughs> and and you know and, and the other the other wow. thing to think about, and I I know I know you do, but um, you know it's not so much voter registration, it's voter history. Um, how do yeah, how do those districts vote? How what what percentage of vote of the vote did Trump get? Mm-hmm. Um, you know. What? How did Republicans before Trump lower down the ballot do in 2012, 2014? Um, because I do think, other than Anthony's overcoming that regist- that two to one registration, you know, um, I don't know if I don't know if there is there's no panacea for overcoming a four to one registration um, unless you've got, you know, the name ID of Eli Manning. Um, <laughs> I, I don't see it happen. That's probably the only time. I would tell somebody not to listen to chip my chicken soup episode uh, and go relax and maybe change your registration. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it, you know, overcoming the registration disadvantage, I think, uh, is a, is a tough battle. Well, and I, I think for a lot of those, you know, you, you got to first, first of all, I, I'm always going to encourage people to stay true to what you believe in. You know, if you're, mm-hmm. if you're a liberal Democrat, don't pretend to be anything other than that. It, it, it may, and of course, as a conservative, I hope it'll make it more difficult for free to be elected. But at the end of the day, I feel like overall, if you're true to who you are, you're going to be a much better salesman for what you believe in. And it's going to be a lot harder to attack you if you're consistent in what you're fighting for. And so if, whether you're a, a conservative Republican, a, you know, you know, whether it's a Raz Shaver or Ted Cruz style, or whether you're a, a liberal Democrat, it's going to be much easier for you to build a coalition around what you truly believe in because you're going to be a better salesman for it, whether you're at the door or on TV or anything else. It, it's just a fact. That if you believe in something, you're going to be better at selling it. I think uh, what you touched on about getting out there, um, you know, people want to vote for somebody that can, that they can see, hear, and touch and, and that they've, you know, 
could meet. And so at a local level, you can overcome a, a, an amazing amount of disadvantages, whether it's money, a voter registration to an extent. And it, it just comes down to, uh, to pounding the pavement, uh, staying true to your beliefs, having a good team around you, and, uh, and having fun. Because if you're not having fun, your team's not going to stay with you. Amen. Uh, and if you lose, <laughs> if you lose, you're not gonna end. You're not gonna lose well, and it's just gonna be all over your face. So I, um, you know, we have there's a, a big lobbyist here in Delaware whose dad was a very well respected lobbyist. His dad was a former attorney general, La- Laird Stabler, and uh, you know, one of the things whenever I was, you know, on the campaign trail, he would always ask me whenever he would see me, "Are you having fun?" Because it's important. Yes, and, uh, it is. It is. It's um, very important. You know, the some of the best ad, advice I got was uh, on the campaign show was from my sister saying just enjoy the process, enjoy the process. I mean, you know, when you're running for office, it's 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 truly a privilege to to live in a democracy where you can have peaceful yet contested elections. It's it's a uh, it's a blessing that billions of people, literally billions of people across the world, uh, would love to have. So it's such an honor to partake in that and. Um, you know, to, to bring it back to the podcast, I'm obviously I'm trying to pitch it a little. <laughs> um, As you should, you know, it's, it's a fantastic, yeah, fantastic yeah. venue. It's uh, it's ex- running for office is it's accessible to everybody. Um, I just got back from these episodes aren't up yet, but I just got back up from the uh, Pacific Northwest, and I was in uh, Oregon, uh, Washington, and Idaho, and I spoke with uh, Chloe U. Daly, who just won. Uh, Portland City Council in 2016, and she uh, she out left winged one of the left wing incumbents, and she was one of the first candidates to beat an incumbent since 1992, and uh, is a high school dropout, single mom, uh, one of only eight women ever elected to Portland Council. So you know y- you don't have to wait for um, you know that degree. For that next committee, uh, you know, you just got to get out there and do it. That's really what it comes down to. And it, you know, it, the politics is a marketplace, and we, uh, the market needs competition. And if we don't challenge the old timers, uh, if we don't challenge the people who've never stayed at an Airbnb or don't understand what Lyft or Uber is, uh, we're going to let those people regulate those companies, and nobody's going to benefit from that. Well, I I love to kind of dive back into to your background. So I mean, you spent a lot of time in law enforcement, military. So yeah, you know, what was it? Yeah, you know, first of all, that brought you into those situation in public service, and then on to to run for office and, and being interested sure. in interviewing political officials and folks who ran underdog <laughs> campaigns, all that fun stuff. Sure. So, you know, I grew up very patriotic. My dad is a I would say a fierce Republican. My mom. A Democrat, a moderate Democrat, but very, you know, all, both very patriotic. And uh, I remember getting misty eyed at Lee, Lee Greenwood's proud to be an American, you know, <laughs> for <Absolutely>. some time. <laughs> and then uh, after 9-11 happened, I, uh, I was a freshman at University of Delaware and I felt so compelled by it that I enlisted uh, right, right after Thanksgiving in 2001 and finished my freshman oh, wow. year at UD, went to I. um, Went to basic training, came back, uh, ended 2002, um, started my winter session at University of Delaware in January 2003. Two weeks into it, got the call to uh, that we were mobilizing. Obviously, we knew we were going to Iraq. And so two months later, we were crossing the border from uh, Kuwait into Iraq. I was probably one of the first 100,000 soldiers in Iraq. Um, And we uh, we were in Nazaria. had a, a prison that we were basically the fancy term that our captains made up for it was a transshipment point. So it was basically like a temporary <laughs> holding facility right. for, for prisoners between Baghdad and Umm Qasr, which was the Southern tip of Iraq. So we were there for March to November. And then, uh, in November we moved up to Baghdad and had the, uh, high value detainee site. So Saddam Hussein was at my prison. Um, I was actually working the night, uh, the special forces guys caught, caught him. Wow. And yeah, That's so I was awesome. working there. You know, so we, we were in a prison in a secure compound. So it was, it was right. kind of silly how, um, you know, because we had the high value detainees, like we had the 101st doing foot patrol 
outside our prison while, you know, army guys are walking by them and, you know, they're PTs just because, uh, you know, it's a secure facility, but because of the people, they're still, uh, was, they were still giving it extra patrols. But, you know, the special forces guy comes up and he's like, Hey, where's your commander? I'm like, I don't know, but I'll go, I'll go find him and wake him up. And uh, sure enough, what ended, what I found out later, they brought up, uh, they, they grabbed out uh, Tariq Aziz, who's the former uh, foreign minister, and a mm-hmm. few others, and uh, they had them positively identify Saddam because you know we didn't actually believe that we caught him. Yeah, I was in a freaking spider hole. Uh, <laughs> yeah, who thinks that's yeah. gonna happen? Exactly, exactly. But yeah, so he was, uh, um, you know, he was at our prison, and you know, I'll tell you the the strangest thing that the biggest lesson I learned from Iraq and um, being with those these uh, mass murderers, they were the most charming, uh, intelligent mass murderers I would have never suspect existed. Uh, And I think that's a lesson to all of us, uh, especially if you're thinking about running for office, that don't be fooled by someone's charisma. Um, You know, you just don't know, you know, until you actually know that person, um, you know, just be forewarned because, you know, we never had an incident in the prison with the high value detainees. They were more than compliant, you know, cause they're super smart, intelligent people. And, oh, and yeah. granted they were trying to, they were trying to game the 19, 20 year old soldiers work in the prison. Right. Right. Um, but you know, it was just a lesson that, um, yeah, just to share a quick story about Tariq Aziz and how charming he was, not charming, but this was just a, my first interaction with him was, uh, when we just got up to the base, I went up to my buddy that was working the compound and I was like, hey, I, I, where's Tariq Aziz? And, uh, you know, because I was eight years old during the first Gulf War. And I remember <laughs> Tariq Aziz on TV. Yeah. And uh, and he's like, oh, I'll show you. So we go over to his little the, – the prison was old Iraqi Army barracks. And uh, he takes me over to him. And uh, he's like, hey, Tariq, I want to I wanna show you. I want to introduce you to somebody. So I'm like, hey, Tariq, I remember, I remember you on TV when I was a kid. And he says to me, ah, oh, yes, I was much skinnier then. It was just, you know, I, it cracked me up. And I was just thinking, you know, th- here's the sign of a very charismatic serial killer, basically. Absolutely. Um, so it's just, uh, it was just a, a, a red flag about um, what people are capable of and how conniving they can be. Um, but so that was a long, long rabbit hole about Iraq. So I came back, uh, finished up UD, got my first job in Manhattan working in finance. Um, but then uh, Newark police... I applied to them my senior year and they they hired me and uh, had a great, great experience with them. Had a, actually had a viral video that you probably didn't know about, Raz. Had a viral video where I walked down Main Street giving out free hugs and uh, 10 police departments across the country copied it. And uh, so did a lot of community outreach. And you kind of fell into that, right? I mean, that was kind of a random idea you had because I, I hadn't heard about the idea. Yeah. I hadn't heard about that until I first talked to you a few weeks back you know, before Christmas and you know of course then I did some you know googling and looking you up on YouTube and stuff and started to find some stuff and that was kind of a random idea you had right yeah I mean people have done you know people have held up free hug signs before but uh, I don't think anybody's done it in, no nobody has done it in police uniform before me and my buddy did it and uh, yeah, there's not many guys so, walking around the streets in Newark with like Glock strapped to their <laughs> belt and hanging out with handcuffs asking for free hugs. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. If anybody if you just Google hashtag hug a cop the video, if, under the video section, it'll pop up. That's great. But uh, yeah, it was it was replicated by at least 10 police departments that I found pictures of online. Uh, so I, I just was very passionate about community outreach. And, you know, it was a big lesson for my rack when we were um when we were in Iraq, it was about winning the hearts and minds. And uh, one thing I forgot to say, I was at Abu Ghraib for just about a week. It was um, they got hit with some mortars. So they moved us up there just, uh, you know, when we were down in Nazaria, they moved us up there just for a bit. Went back down. You know, nothing. There was nothing to write home about at all. And it was before anybody knew anything about some of the uh, the atrocity atrocities that were going on with the American soldiers torturing Iraqis in case mm-hmm. it's not in case Abu Ghraib doesn't ring a bell. Um, but so when I got back from Iraq in 2004, Abu Ghraib was all over the headlines and it was the first thing people would ask me about, like, Oh, were you at Abu Ghraib? As if, as if I were there, which I was, that I was therefore <laughs> complicit with what yeah, right. you know, 10, 10 jackass soldiers did. But it, it showed to me 
how uh, impressionable people are from the actions of so few. So that was a mentality that I really tried to embody as a police officer and and just be cognizant that when I'm dealing with a member of the public, especially if they're a member of the law abiding public, I might be the only interaction they have for decades. And there's no reason that I can't do whatever I need to do, but be professional, cordial and courteous about it. Um, and so with the hug a cop idea came about because it was right after Eric Garner in New York, right after uh, Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, right. And then it was the Baltimore riots were popping off in January 2015, if I mm-hmm. remember correctly. And that's when I, I finally brought it up. Like, I realize this idea is totally ridiculous, um, but I brought it up through the uh, our very bureaucratic chain of command. And, uh, you know, after uh, finally they, they said it was good to go. So once the weather got nice in May, me and a buddy walked down Main Street and, you know, we had a good old time. Felt very vulnerable at the same time because you're really kind of exposing yourself like, hey, I'm doing this absolutely cockamamie idea <laughs> and I have no idea how it will go over. But, uh, you know, it was very from the get go. It was very well received. Um, and if you watch, you know, the, you can tell uh, the people appreciated it. And yeah, we put the video out and I remember, uh, you know, it was just getting it was literally getting multiple shares a second. And uh, so in aggregate, because a few different sources have posted the video, but it's been viewed over 20 million times at a wow. minimum. And uh, 10 police departments across the country. And actually one in Texas, Aaron Millo, I want to say. Yeah, that Amarillo. Bell. Yeah, yeah, out there in Amarillo, the very, yeah. very far in North Panhandle, Texas. Yeah, as you were you know, kind of moving forward from when you were in the Army and then law enforcement, I'd love to find some of the examples of, of lessons you learned during your run for office. Um, in terms of related to being a cop? You know, or, really, you know, just the the main top ones. You know, I'm I'm sure some of them have to do with being a cop, but looking generally at you know your race, uh, you know, you've you've cataloged a lot of your the lessons from the the people you've interviewed. Now, I don't want to give too many people an out from uh, downloading the episode because I'm hoping they're going to go find <laughs> your find your podcast and download it. I, I don't want to give them too much of the secrets there, but yeah. I'd love to find out more about the specific lessons that you learned during your your time running for office. Sure, sure. Well. Uh, let me let me hype one thing real quick. So not only did I do a hug a cop video, this will I'm sure you'll appreciate this, Raz. I did a hug a Republican video during the campaign. <laughs> there you go. Uh, me and yeah, if you search for hashtag hug a Republican, it should pop up. But myself and Mike Castle, the former Delaware governor and congressman, and uh, our current state treasurer Ken Simpler, uh, in September 2016, there was a big event at a local park and. We did. Uh, we gave out free hugs as a as Republicans, and uh, it did not go over as well as being a cop. <laughs> but uh, no, it was still positively received in the video. I think uh, it would get some chuckles. But um, you know, I would say, Raz, what it comes down to, and it's um, it, it's no different than why police officers need to be out uh, walking the beat. And meeting people, it's the same reason that candidates need to be on the street and meeting people. And I, it's just it just comes down to um, breaking down those barriers and letting the person, the people, your your constituents, whether you're a cop or whether you're a candidate, letting those constituents know that they can trust you and they can they can approach you and they can have that relationship and ideally vote for you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm doubling down on voter contact above all else, whether it's, uh, standing in front of grocery stores in February before a November election, as opposed to, uh, October when, uh, when everybody's doing it. Um, you know, it's just, uh, and, and not, not being afraid to be different. I'm, um, I, Chloe, you daily. Uh, the Portland city councilwoman that I mentioned, her handout was a comic book. Yes. A comic book. Really? You know, everybody, everybody passes out a palm card, a magnet, maybe she had a, her, she, she was another single issue candidate and uh, she, she ran on the the rent crisis in Portland and ran on a rent control platform. Um, And so she described that the crisis through a comic book. So it's real. You know, as I was walking down main street, 
giving out free hugs, I was taking a risk. And when you're an underdog in a political election, it's no different. You can't go by the playbook. You can't you can't be conventional. You have to you have to double down on your strengths and what makes you unique as a person and a candidate and run with them. You you can't run a boilerplate campaign as an underdog and expect to win. You just can't. You got to be open to taking risk. Uh, you got to you got to be thinking for a different way to do things. Uh, I mean, I mean, Raz, let me put it this way to you. If you know, if you were running a campaign and I came to you or if you were running my campaign and I came to you as like, hey, I want to I want to put out a comic book. You'd be like, dude, what what is wrong with you? Am I right? <laughs> like that. I would that have would some questions about your sanity. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that and, and and understandably so. But um, luck, you know, Chloe, you know, she that was true to her. Um, Absolutely. And I think that's what you know, you have to be true to yourself as a candidate. And as a, a an elected official, and if if you want to run a campaign doing something outside the box, you have to do it. You just have to because uh, you're 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 leaving votes on the table to to run it the conventional way against somebody who's already you know against an incumbent who are, has already gotten the votes before. Well, I mean, whether you're, you know, the Greeks trying to take Troy or Caesar trying to go take Rome or, you know, <laughs> you know, Americans trying to go and, 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 and change things in Iraq, you know, when you're fighting an insurgent battle, when you're trying to fight against an established norm, whatever it might be, political, military, religious, whatever it is, you, you look at that and you count the odds and you say, look, if I fight the same battle that's been fought before, I have no chance of winning. And so you have to look at that and say, okay, so how am I going to fight this in a different way? Uh, whether it's different numbers and types of material, whether it's a different strategy, whatever it is, you have to do something different. Otherwise, you're going to be crushed against the rocks. And when, mm-hmm. we, when we look at military history, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of studying military history, and I believe it has immense application in politics as far as the broad lessons learned there. You know, when we look at that, there's great opportunity to say, look, if you want to win where nobody's won before, there's large, there's probably going to be a good reason they've lost. So you study that loss and say, what can I do different? And generally speaking, it takes an out-of-the-box strategy. And that's why I, I think we see, you know, in some cases, younger people that are willing to adopt a, a strategy that the conventional wisdom says is impossible. They adopt that and they win. And it's because they were willing to think in a different way. It's it's a very much a David versus Goliath thing. You know, in the Bible, when we read about David and Goliath, nobody thought David was to come out very well. They thought he was trying to get his butt kicked, and he was end up dead and crushed. And he adopted a different strategy that was uniquely suited to fight against Goliath's weak points. And he adopted that, and he mm-hmm. won. And when you're running for political office, you have to have a similar analysis of where is my opponent weak versus strong and in a very Sun Tzu like way you want to say okay if he's strong there I ain't gonna attack there I'm not gonna try to match up you know stone for stone against where he's strong I'm gonna try to find the areas where he's weak Mm -hmm. if you are a younger ish candidate and you are not running a fresh campaign um, you're you're not living up to your potential because the other aspect of doing something outside the box, you know, I, half the district I ran in in 2016 was a a city and, uh, we had a seven way primary for Lieutenant governor, seven way primary for Congress, seven way primary for mayor. So I would go to a doorstep and there might be literally five, five pieces of literature. And, you know, I just had a palm card, but had I had a comic book or something, a totally zany way to get my message out, that would at least be memorable. So something I would say to anybody listening from a campaign strategy standpoint is how are you standing out? How are you, how are you promoting uh, the uniqueness in you and differentiating yourself from possibly the multitude of campaigns going on alongside, alongside yours? How are you going to prevent your literature from not getting tossed in the trash can along with everyone else's? And that's that's a perpetual struggle. And I think that from the very beginning, you got to look at what what is my value add. What am I doing that's different than anybody else? How am I going to help these people that I represent in a way that 
Nobody else is trying to help. I mean, it's, it's much like if you're starting a business, you're saying, how am I going to help these consumers that are looking for X? And, and how am I going to do this different than Walmart or Target or wh- whatever it might be? Unless you have a unique value proposition, you really don't have a business running or trying to start that business because you should know that you're not going to do well. It's not going to be worth, you know, you're not going to create ROI over what you're expending. But if you do something unique, if there's something that's truly special about you, and you gotta, you got to solicit a lot of advice from people who you trust to make sure that you are truly providing unique value add, if that's who you are, then you need to at least think about running for office and, and standing up and saying, look, this is what I believe in. Whether you win the first time or not, that's not the measure of success. Uh, and actually, I think this is a great segue to talk about, you know, kind of as we're wrapping up, you mentioned early on, like in the first minute or so, talking about losing well and I 100% agree that there you can lose in a in a good way and a bad way so as we're kind of getting close to wrapping up talk to folks about I mean and hopefully nobody's listening to us that that's on on our side is going to lose but talk about the the difference what you mean by that sure I, I think losing well it's not even just about the results uh assuming you lost it's not about 49 percent or 40 percent it's about um are you presenting the best version of you to the candidates? And equally important, are you working your tail off? Because I would say to anybody, if you're not going to work hard at, at running for office, that's probably the only reason you shouldn't do it. Because it takes uh, an, inordinate, an inordinate amount of work and people are literally giving you their treasure uh, and investing mm-hmm. in you. And for you to thumb your nose at them and not work your you're, you know, not work to the max, uh, to, to, to be worthy of their donations. You're disrespecting your supporters and you're disrespecting your future constituents. Yes. Uh, but I think, um, so one work hard, uh, you know, that's simple. And I just elaborated on that, but that's, imp- that's an important aspect of, of, uh, working hard of, of losing well, excuse me Two, uh, move the dialogue, you know, when you're a candidate, you have a platform, you have a podium. Uh, speaking about issues that are relevant to the to your constituents and the state, uh, you know it's it's a it's a remarkable opportunity that if you come across in a intelligent way, if you bring up viewpoints that people might not have thought about, if you double down on your background. I talked a lot about criminal justice reform because I was a cop, so I was bringing up stuff that. I had authority to speak on and I think people appreciated that. So, you know, double down on on what you know and work that into your campaign. If you're a teacher, you know, obviously speaking about education makes sense. Um, And three, I think your demeanor and waging a positive campaign. And I'm sure there's some strategists that would disagree with me. But, um, you know, in a local election, people are going to know your opponent. They're going to know him, uh, know, and I say him, obviously I mean her, whatever. Um, they're right. going to know the person you're, uh, you're running against. And if they have a positive appreciation of that person and they have a neutral impression of you up until that point, and then you start bashing that person that they like, that's something they might remember. So I would say in a local election, be as positive as possible, uh, hammer away on their votes. Uh, but try to stay above board. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, going negative is a, I think it's a dangerous route in a, in a local election. What are your thoughts on that, Raz? Yeah, I, I do think that the default, in my opinion, is unless you have a really clear, uh, at the very minimum, if you're going to go negative, you better have a good backing as far as their voting record and what they publicly said. If you're going purely on their personal history, their decisions they made on a personal level, the, it's probably going to backfire you. And that's even if they've made some very regrettable personal decisions that you think disqualifies them on a character basis. You really want to make sure that, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of putting significant investment into a individual vulnerability study, making sure that you know where you're vulnerable from an OPPO research perspective. And I believe in investing in making sure you know what's out there on your opponent. 
But that said, that's not me saying that uh, that I'm I'm a fan of going after somebody because their their son got divorced or they them and their wife had a fight one time or you know they yeah. they, they got divorced. It, it, that's on a case by case basis. I generally believe that they, that a very good rule is leave the family the heck out of it. This is about a person and this is about policy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you want to be very very careful about that. Uh, there are situations where a person's you know I'm a big believer in electing people of character. Those are the people that I fight for. And that's the kind of person I would want to be if I was running for office. Um, you got to keep your eyes out for that. Um, but it's a case by case basis where you'd be very careful about you know when you're choosing to attack somebody for a non policy reason for for a character related reason, making sure that you understand the full implications of that and that they deserve what you're throwing at them. Because I've seen far too many examples of people that you know they might they might be a decent person and the their opponent might not be that great in my eyes but they go too far out of their skis or they don't fully understand the implication of what they're saying and they get themselves in a really tough spot because they're not actually doing the the homework that they're you know they kind of get the uh, the silver bullet syndrome where they see that they just look at a, an opportunity they fixate on it and they attack it and they don't think about holy crap this could really backfire me a big way because I'm fixing to be a jackass if I say this I don't believe in just trashing people uh, I I think that the, the negative campaigning in the context of fighting somebody's record uh, potentially their character but as, especially when it comes to what they fought for make it about the issues. Um, you know, sure. if, if there's somebody that has a significant character deficit, that may very well be something to bring up. But at the end of the day, they're there to vote for policies and to fight for specific ideas. And there's in most campaigns that I've been around, there's plenty of stuff to fight about there without opening up yourself or them to the liability of of talking about anything else. Yeah, and you know, just thinking about it uh, while you were talking, I think if you are running against an incumbent and they get negative against you. That is uh, that is a golden goose. Absolutely. Uh, one, it means they're scared, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, you know something, some uh, some wisdom that I've heard along the way is that uh, an election against an incumbent is a referendum on the incumbent. And if people are talking about you before the election, that's not good. But if they're talking about the incumbent, that's a good thing for the opposing candidate. And I can think of. Uh, you know, Matt Meyer, I referenced him earlier, our, our county executive who beat a three term county uh, exec. Um, that campaign got real nasty at the end. Uh, Matt Meyer was a State Department diplomat in Iraq in 2010. And uh, the his opponent, the incumbent again, uh, sent out a uh, didn't send out, but dropped off some literature trying to imply that Matt wasn't in Iraq and had a picture of him on a, on a amusement park ride. And, uh, sure enough, the voters showed him the door. And I think of Melanie Stambaugh, who was uh, 24 when she was elected to the Washington state legislature, her opponent, again, the incumbent obviously waged a campaign against her supposed lack of experience. And Melanie had some smart rebuttals and she won. So, uh, I, you know, in local campaigns, be cautious about being negative. And if you're in, if your incumbent opponent is going negative against you, that's uh, you prepare the victory party. <laughs> I agree 100 percent. It's if you are in the, the situation where you're the underdog and your opponent's going after you hardcore, that's one of those things you just let back, give them all the rope they want and they're going to hang themselves. Sure. And. Just to uh, to tie a bow to losing well, the last thing I would say is, uh, and this is probably easier said than done. Easier said than done. But I was blessed that my uh, my team, my campaign volunteers, were my friends, and my friends were my campaign volunteers, and so we were we were always just happy to be out there, presented a good, positive Im- impression. Uh, I was very thankful for their help, and so you know, having a good team. And again, you can't just buy. I mean, I guess you can buy a good team, uh, but you know. The more your friends are able to go out there and support you, the better off you'll be. Well, and you can buy, in some cases, a good team, but it's never going to be as good as good friends. And and those can be, as you said, earned over the span of a campaign. Those can be folks that are your good friends and believe in you from the beginning. But that kind of, of strong relationship, it comes through. I mean, I've always been a big fan of, especially when it comes to ground game, the best ambassadors are the ones that are closest relationally to you. 
that means that if I'm out there knocking doors, the people that are going to be the best ambassador for me are my brothers, my family, my wife, my best friend, people that know me a long time and have put up with my sorry butt for <laughs> as many years as possible, <laughs> right? And and the, the volunteers that just met me last week at a rally, uh, they might be great. They might be really good talking to folks and connecting with people, but they're not going to be as good because of their relational distance as somebody that's known me for 20 years and been my you know, best man at my wedding and godfather of my kid and all those things. It's, it's qualitatively different. Uh, it can still be effective, but you know, I, on, the, on the whole, we want people that are closer to me than others that I can actually be my ambassadors. And we want to grow out from there concentrically. And so I think there's there's a unique opportunity for principal individuals that want to run for office and make a difference in their community. Find out what you believe in. Build a coherent campaign plan. Find how you know, the, the unique opportunity you provide your district. And then go talk to people. You know, near and far, whatever the medium is, that's what James and I are talking about. You want to go out there and communicate with individuals and build those relationships. That's how you know, he's been able to build an audience. That's how I've been able to help candidates in the past. I think that's how we help impact the direction of our country because that's what we need more than ever. I, I think it comes down to people that are willing to, to be intellectually honest and be willing to do what they feel like is better for the country, not just themselves. And that's that's why I've been a big fan of what James is doing of the Elected Officials of America podcast. I hope you guys are listening will check that out. Go uh, electedofficialsofamerica.com. Uh, James, that's the, the name of the podcast as well, right? Yeah, so if you just search for that on iTunes, it'll pop up. Uh, or you go right to that domain, you can get to the iTunes link. Um, but yeah, Raz, it was great talking to you, man. Love the work you're doing as well. Love, lis- love listening to your podcast, and I uh, really enjoyed chatting with you. Well, it's been, it's been fantastic building a relationship with you and getting to listen to what you're doing. I highly recommend that Chicken Soup for the Elected Officials Soul podcast. Uh, that's It's really, really good you know, for folks to listen to that and kind of get a recap. That, that I think that's a great introductory episode. That's the Chicken Soup for the Candidate's Soul. Um, you, they can go to electedofficialsofamerica.com to find that or search for you on iTunes. That's a good opportunity for them to kind of get an intro to your podcast, right? Absolutely. No better way, especially if you're – Running for office now, or you're on the fence. Uh, I think you'll find uh, you'll find some humor in that uh, and some comfort. Fantastic. Well, we <laughs> if you're running for office, you probably need some of both: some humor, some comfort, some advice. <laughs> yeah. All those things are are. Uh, you may be having too much advice, but but he's got some uh, he's got some good advice for you. So I hope you go check it out. Electedofficialsofamerica.com. Search for it on iTunes. Thank you guys so much for subscribing to the podcast, for listening to us every week. Uh, it makes it fun to do what I do. I know James feels the same about his podcast. Hopefully you'll subscribe that over there. Uh, keep sending us information, ideas, questions, uh, recommendations for interviews, and we'll be uh, we'll be doing more and more each week, looking to send you guys more advice as far as how to go win elections. So take care. We'll t- talk to you guys again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.